right, this will be a shorter episode on the anthropology of tourism. Interesting topic for 2020. It's uh, almost cliche at this point to say that COVID-19 is making us rethink everything or that there's no going back to how things were before March or that we're entering a new normal or approaching one. And like I said last time, I do hate that phrase, the new normal. But from a brief review of some of the research that's come out this year about tourism, it looks like a lot of those cliches do apply to tourism and what it might look like in the future. So let's start local. Destination Toronto, which is the organization that promotes tourism in this city, expects tourism revenue to be cut in half in 2020, which means a few billion dollars lost. Globally, the World Tourism Organization, which is an agency of the UN, said back in May that they were expecting international tourism to decline 60 to 80 percent over the year. Or look at this article from Tourism Geographies, an academic journal from April, which says this is an historic transformative moment full of possibilities to imagine newer and better forms of tourism. Because tourism, as was commonly practiced up until COVID, as the, this author puts it, supported neoliberal injustices and exploitation. And this author, Freya Higgins Debois, thinks that we can reconceptualize tourism as something that's maybe actually good for local people through what she calls the community-centered uh, tourism framework. So what would that look like? Well, states could make sure tourism is in the hands of local corporations and businesses rather than huge multinationals. Um, they can make those local corporations pay a fair amount of taxes, so no more tax havens like the ones that multinationals often use. If tourist enterprises go bankrupt, then it's former workers who should be paid off first. Uh, states could support cooperatives, social enterprises, nonprofits, and get local public's input on all tourism-related planning and, and decisions. But then the awkward thing is, even if tourism was to make really good things happen for local communities, once the tourists are there, uh, the process still contributes to climate change because the tourists have to get there. So according to this study, uh, the carbon footprint of global tourism Tourism accounted for about 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions from 2009 to 2013, and surprise, surprise, most of that damage is being done by people from high-income countries. So in this moment when many people are forced to pause and think, it's a good time to also pause and think about how some things that many of us have taken for granted as, as neutral or normal, such as the expectation or even the entitlement to be able to fly to a vacation destination once a year, all of that was actually maybe quite a bit selfish. And now, listen up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. This whole series is based on lectures that I've given in various intro to anthropology classes over the past five or so years. So I've been covering some of the content in this episode since 2015. And until now, I always phrased everything in the present tense. But because so much of tourism is now on pause and it will very likely be quite different once it's back on, um, all of this is past tense now. So what follows is an introduction to the anthropology of tourism as tourism was practiced before COVID-19. So here's the plan. I'll talk about tourism in the context of globalization, and in doing so, I'll introduce you to what anthropologists and other scholars have said about three different types of tourism. There's resort tourism, sex tourism, and some relatively new forms of tourism that are marketed as being authentic. And there's a link in the description to a documentary I highly recommend about a kind of, a kind of tourism that fits that last category, the so-called authentic type of tourism. First, I won't go through all of these. It's just a reminder of some key words from earlier in the series, globalization, cultural change, cultural imperialism, and neoliberalism. So think about how all of these relate to these examples of tourism that are coming up. For a bit of context, here's a review of some facts about the global movement of humans, which itself is nothing new. That goes back to early hunter-gatherer societies moving from place to place. As for the kinds of movements that this series is mostly about, 
Much of that began, began with European colonialism in the Americas, which began with first contact in 1492, um, as I discussed in episode two. This is really the roots of what's now called globalization. But often when people think about globalization, they're thinking about aspects of it that are new. And one of those is the huge number of people who don't live in the nation in which they were born and raised. Uh, another point that is kind of new about globalization is how easy it is for those migrants to stay in touch with their home community. Anthropologists use the idea of space-time compression to describe that. So the internet and other technology lets us communicate so quickly and across such huge distances that it's as if the space between places is being closed and as if time is being shortened. But I also mentioned that for all this mobility, there's still huge restrictions on it. So for example, nearly nine tenths of the world still lives in the country in which they were born. 70% uh, of international migrants come from the global south and roughly half of them moved from one country in the global south to another. So many people are moving because they need to. And the concept of doing that for fun is, is really a privilege that's accessible to a very small proportion of humanity. And like I said at the start of this episode, that very small proportion of humanity is uh, apparently causing about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions just for fun. Which I think is a good segue into this kind of sidebar on the concept of the expatriate or expat for sure. So what does expat mean? In a literal sense, it means someone who lives either temporarily or permanently in a country other than the one in which they were brought up. Sometimes they're doing that for fun, um, kind of like long-term tourists maybe. More often they're doing it for work. So in that case especially, when is someone an expat versus when is someone an immigrant and what's the difference? Well, here's the difference according to this article from 2015. And the article puts it very bluntly. So as the sub headline goes, surely any person going to work outside their country is an expatriate. But no, the word exclusively applies to white people. So in short, this author is arguing that the idea of the expat is this old colonial concept that is still in a lot of our vocabulary. So basically, if a European or a white North American goes to live some way, someplace in, in the Caribbean or South America or Asia or Africa, for example, that person might be called an expatriate, but probably never an immigrant but people who come from the Caribbean, South America, Asia, or Africa to go live in Europe or North America will probably never be called expatriates. They're, they're called immigrants. Uh, for the most part, people just kind of use these words without thinking about them, like I sometimes did before I saw this article. But seeing how the distinction upholds those old colonial relations and, and really reinforces white privilege at a global scale, I've taken it out of my vocabulary. So here's an article about how that idea, that distinction, plays out in Hong Kong. This piece is from 2014 from the Wall Street Journal. So not exactly a radical publication of you know critical race studies. It's the Wall Street Journal, and the article goes, who is an expat anyway? It was written by a Canadian journalist who has been living in Hong Kong for six years, uh, by that point that it was written in 2014. And as he puts it, anyone with roots in a Western country, such as himself, in Hong Kong is considered an expat. But for example, Filipino domestic workers in Hong Kong are called guests, not expats, even if they lived there for decades. So as, as the journalist puts it, quote, Mandarin speaking mainland Chinese, for example, are also rarely regarded as expats, but they are certainly not locals. While by contrast, a native Cantonese speaker earns an automatic right to belong, even if she spent most of her life in Sydney or Vancouver. None of this is to single out Hong Kong for criticism, because we, we can make the same point about many other societies and how they describe people who come to them. But the point is, the words we use to describe people who move from place to place matter a lot, because they are related to real differentials in power and privilege that really affects people in their everyday lives. Speaking of the legacy of tourism, that is a monument to Christopher Columbus in Santo Domingo, which is the oldest permanent Spanish settlement in the Americas. I, I showed you this image in episode two, and it's relevant here again because the legacy of colonialism is one of the main themes of the anthropology of tourism. So as I've said, most of the former colonies were decolonized by the 1960s and 70s, if not sooner. So in the case of the Dominican Republic, it was about a century sooner. But in terms of the global distribution of wealth and power, in many cases, the relationship hasn't changed that much. Economically, most former colonies remain in kind of a similar position to the one they were in before decolonization. And that's the context in which this tiny fraction of humanity has the ability, has the privilege of traveling from one nation state to another purely for fun. So 
when you look at international tourism, often the tourists are from the former colonizing powers and the places they go to are often former colonies. So in other words, tourist destinations tend to be beautiful places with small, vulnerable economies. And that last point is especially clear with regards to resort tourism, which usually involves people spending a week or so in a self-contained environment, usually as part of an all-inclusive package. So resorts tend to be very similar from place to place. Um, many tourists don't care much about what country they're visiting as long as the resort looks something like this. In some cases, people don't even know what language the local workers speak when they're at home in the country they go to. Um, again, as long as the resorts look something like this. Uh, these places tend to be owned by multinational corporations and tend to be staffed by local workers earning very low wages. Some anthropologists who study tourism have used this concept to describe these kinds of resorts, the idea of the simulacrum. So a simulacrum is a copy of an original that no longer exists or that never existed in the first place. And the classic example of these, to step aside from tourism for a minute, is the idea of the 50s diner. Uh, apparently diners didn't actually look much like that in the 50s. It's more of like an 80s fantasy and 80s nostalgia for what the 50s once looked like because the, the, the 50s were trendy in the 80s, so the 50s diner was popularized, but it's a copy of an original that no longer exists or never existed in the first place. So that idea also applies arguably to a lot of resorts. Resorts don't often look very much like the rest of the countries they're in. And like I said a minute ago, I don't think many tourists care but the design of a typical resort comes from somewhere and that place is, well, it's a fantasy of what the Caribbean is like and what it's like to live there. And here's a more obvious example of this simulacrum idea from Cancun, Mexico, where, for example, some resorts are built as replicas or imitations of Mayan pyramids. So in some sense, it's a copy of an original that no longer exists or never existed in the first place. <laughs> leads us to the idea of authenticity. Uh, some tourists do want to get away from the resorts and take in a so-called authentic experience of the local culture. So authenticity is one of those terms that anthropologists always put in scare quotes. Uh, needs to be questioned. Now on the surface, I guess it's nice that people want to see how others live and, and learn something on their trip. But the idea of seeking out an authentic experience somewhere else carries its own sets of problems as well. One example of that that's become more popular in the past 20 or so years is what's called slum tourism. So here's an advertisement from Mumbai, India, where you can go and spend four hours in Dharavi, the, the so-called slum of about a million people, which has been an especially high-profile community since 2008 because the film Slumdog Millionaire takes place there. Uh, most of this kind of tourism happens in the global south, but you can also do kind of the same thing here in Canada now. So, for example, there are guided tours of the downtown east side of Vancouver where you can go and kind of check out and experience all the homelessness and addiction for yourself. On a similar note is favela tourism in Brazilian cities, especially Rio de Janeiro. Um, favelas also came up in the last episode, by the way, on medical anthropology. Anyway, I'm going to start with an overview of their history um, and then get into, you know, what tourists are doing in them now. Favelas are huge informal communities that formed largely through internal migration within Brazil. So for the most part, that was people moving from the poorest regions of Brazil into the outskirts and the steep hillsides of its wealthier cities. Uh, these internal migrants came mostly from the northeast of the country, which in colonial times had a plantation economy and a cattle industry. But by the late 1800s, there were a series of droughts that began this pattern of out-migration that started to form the favelas. Uh, this was in the context of nationwide economic instability and a huge gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, the pattern continued through the 20th century and during a military dictatorship, which began in 1964, um, among other things, the dictatorship brought in industrial agriculture, which led to severe unemployment in rural areas, which led to even more people moving to the cities to try to get by somehow. Now, to illustrate this with some numbers, the population of Brazil as a, as a nation state went from being 15% urban in 1930 to 50% urban by 1970 to 80% urban 
by 2011, which makes Brazil sound like a very urban country, and it is, but just for context, uh, Canada and the United States are also each about 80% urban in terms of uh, total population, and really Canada and the U.S. also have their own histories of people moving from place to place within the countries themselves in order to find work and even to avoid environmental disasters as well. But back to Brazilian favelas, informal settlements built in and around cities, uh, some of them with populations in the tens of thousands. Most of them are built high in the hills, and in them you'll see a wide variety of structures. Some people live in uh, finished houses, some people live in sheet metal and cinder block structures, and kind of everything in between. And for decades, these places existed almost outside of the state, so nobody would really go there unless they lived there. In some cases, the police didn't even go there. So in that context, who's in charge if not the police? Well, the short answer is gangs. They basically control the drug trade. In some cases, they have a taxation system. They have their own courts, a legal code, and they also protect, protected the communities from rival gangs, and they continued like that for decades. One important sidebar here is that the idea of the gang is more complicated than it seems at first. So on that note, think of some of the points from episode 16, Lawrence Ralph's ob observations of the history of gangs in Chicago and their, their social and their political functions. So whether we're talking about Chicago or Rio de Janeiro or any city really, gangs are often violent organizations and they've done a lot of harm undeniably. And it's important to you know remember and acknowledge that. But their role in their communities is much more complex than just that. So as I mentioned before, Brazil was ruled by a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, and one of the largest gangs in the city of Rio is basically an offshoot of a resistance movement that fought against that dictatorship. So that situation started in Brazilian prisons in the mid-70s when captured revolutionaries were held in the same prisons as gang members, and over time they sort of merged their efforts. So they started organizing politically in the prisons and in the favelas. They started taxing the drug trade, basically to fund an attempted revolution against the dictatorship and while also investing in the community. And all of this is documented in detail in a chapter called Rio's Agony in the book Tropic of Chaos by Christian Parenti, which I highly recommend. You can find the citation in the works cited at the end of the video. But anyway, by about the mid-1980s, that time of political radicalism and activity was mostly over, and uh, the, the gangs pretty much became just gangs by that point, if you want to call them that. Again, very similar to what happened in Lawrence Ralph's ethnography of gangs in, in Chicago. But still, these gangs in urban Brazil operated in some ways as, as like an alternative state in places that were beyond the reach of the official state. So as Christian Parenti put it, Quote, that the criminal structures in the favelas bring together gangsters, police, community leaders, and mainstream politicians in a matrix of mutually beneficial relations. And then around 15 or 20 years ago, the state decided to retake control over some favelas, which they call pacification. That's the official term for this effort, but as you can imagine, it's not usually very peaceful. And this isn't just some, you know, Marxist theory about the role of the state, you know, retaking territory or something. The World Bank also uses this terminology. So, for example, this report from 2012 by the World Bank is called Bringing the State Back into the Favelas of Rio de Janeiro, Understanding Changes to Community Life After the UPP Pacification Process. Uh, the UPP is the main police force involved in these programs. So the way it works is it usually begins with this special unit of the military police who goes in and wages urban warfare against the gang in charge. And if that first wave of military police win that battle, then less and less militarized police units take their place and try to keep the so-called peace. Favela tourism was growing through the 2000s and the 2010s decades. There was an effort to redistribute the wealth across society and improve conditions in favelas. So I want to show you a snapshot of favela tourism in Rio during those times. This is what one favela looks like from above, and here are some views from inside the favela. The one on the left, that picture is, is more or less typical of the kind of structures that you see there. Um, and here's a, a view of the city from inside the favela. Because these communities are high in the hills, they tend to have some of the best views of the city. Well, well best if you're a tourist, but for the residents, it might not exactly be fun to look out on, on the wealthy beachfront communities below. And increasingly, tourists are coming to the favelas and enjoying these views themselves. Uh, that, that, that attention and those visits 
has brought some benefits to local populations. So for one example, there's this elevator that the state government opened in 2010. It, it connects this network of three favelas to a subway station uh, down the hill below. So it's an outdoor elevator. Uh, it, it goes up about 20 stories up the mountainside to the entrance of, of one favela. So it saves people about a 20 story walk uphill every time they come home from work. And on this image, uh, that, that building in the foreground was apparently supposed to be a hotel, but the deal fell through and it was instead made into this huge community center slash church slash school in part through corporate sponsorship. But along with development comes urban warfare. So the, these places that, I, that I've that i shown in these slides had only been pacified a couple of years before these pictures were taken, uh, starting with this, this wing of the, the military police who I mentioned before. And uh, again, this is called pacification, but it's not really the peace. You know, living in a place run by organized crime is undoubtedly stressful, but so is living in a place where you constantly run into the military police. So this is the situation that many locals find themselves in, uh, deals and plans being made about what to do with their communities in which they don't really have any say, just hoping that things work out in a way that might help them get ahead or at least keep what they have. So that was the 2000s and the 2010s. Throughout that era, climate change was adding more fuel to the fire as is happening across the planet, of course. Uh, longer droughts, more severe flooding, which drove more, more and more people into the favelas still. And more recently, in 2018, Brazil elected an authoritarian government which promised, among many other things, a tough-on-crime crackdown on all aspects of Brazilian society. So here's how the Washington Post summarized that situation in uh, May 2019. The headline goes, Brazil's politicians promised to get tough on crime. Now police in Rio are killing nearly five people per day. Uh, one example that resulted in, in massive protests, uh, Jean Rodrigo da Silva was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor who was on his way to teach martial arts to kids inside a favela, and he was shot and killed by police, apparently in a case of mistaken identity. Uh, this comes at a time when the new government had expanded police powers to use lethal force. And now here's some news from 2020. It's estimated that about a quarter of the population of one favela, Hosinha, for example, it's estimated a quarter of the population there has been infected with coronavirus, and researchers are saying the rate of infection in favelas in general could be 30 times higher than the official count uh, because conditions are crowded and sanitation is poor and it's hard to practice social distancing. Now at a national scale, Brazil is second only to the United States in both cases and deaths and Brazilian scientists and doctors have said that the president of the country isn't exactly helping by refusing to wear a mask himself even after announcing that he had contracted the virus and, and later tested negative. But before COVID, there was a time when favelas were hot spots for tourists seeking authentic experiences. And this was in the context of a fascination in Western pop culture with places of extreme poverty. People want to know what life is really like in these legendary impoverished places. Uh, going back to the 1990s, for example, Michael Jackson shot parts of a music video in a favela in 1995 for the song They Don't Care About Us. Um, 95 was a bit past his prime, but the song was still a hit. It was a very angry song with lyrics about racism and police violence. Um, on a less political note, seven, a few years later in 2002, the music video for Beautiful by Snoop Dogg and Pharrell was also shot in Rio de Janeiro, uh, including some scenes in a favela. So it has Snoop and Pharrell basically, I guess, posing like favela crime bosses, kind of sitting back at the top of the hill. Um, hanging out on the beach with objectified models surrounding them. That same year, 2002, the film City of God was also released. This was a, a Brazilian-made Portuguese-language feature film set in the real community of City of God, also in Rio. Um, arguably, it's part of the, the gangster movie genre, so much of the focus of this film is uh, on the mentality of this emerging drug lord who's portrayed pretty much as a sociopath going back to his childhood. So reflecting that, there's a lot of brutal violence in this movie. Uh, it's really well made, so I'm not saying any of this as a criticism of the film itself. If you like gangster movies, I think it's as good as the ones that everybody thinks are classics. This stands up to Goodfellas, in my opinion. But the point for now is that it was the one Brazilian film to find a mass audience in North America. It, it was even in major theaters at the time. Um, and the fact that that happened, I feel, is an example of the stereotypes that shaped North American perceptions of Brazil. 
and the same kind of morbid curiosity that drives some tourists to favelas. Slumdog Millionaire is a very, very different film set in a different place, of course. It's set in the Dharavi community of Mumbai, India, as I mentioned earlier, from 2008. Um, this one is basically a feel-good film. It's about a young man's perseverance and intellect and how that lifted him out of poverty. And, of course, there's a love story that goes along with this. But Slumdog Millionaire was also a part of this search for kind of authentic or insider images of third world so-called slums that's been part of Western pop culture over the past couple of decades. So the vast majority of films that people would go see in a theater in Canada would be in English. And of course they take place in English speaking places. But occasionally there would be a so-called foreign film included in that repertoire. And that foreign film would be seen as a representation of everything about the country in which it takes place. So City of God was, you know, the so-called Brazilian movie and Slumdog Millionaire was the so-called Indian movie. Even though they both tell very particular stories in those nation states that don't really reflect the experiences of everybody who lives in them. For example, the millions of highly educated middle class people in both Brazil and India. But anyway, these images of slums come to stand in for entire countries. Uh, the scholar Ananya Roy calls the slums a metonym in this way, like an image that stands in for the, for the whole. So in the Western pop culture imagination, City of God equals Brazil and Dharavi equals India. And like I said, uh, City of God was, was critically acclaimed and I think generally respected by academics. Uh, Slumdog Millionaire was of course hugely popular, but academics have often criticized this one basically as poverty porn, which might be a bit hard to hear for viewers who enjoyed this film in their younger years. But like I said in the past, academics like to point out harsh realities and ruin people's good time, basically. The last kind of tourism we'll talk about today is sex tourism. And this will be just one brief example of what anthropologists have said about it, about people traveling to buy sex. And those people are often, but not always, men. Um, this example is from Stephen Gregory's ethnography, The Devil Behind the Mirror, which is a study of, of how globalization has affected the Dominican Republic. So the whole book isn't about sex tourism, it's about globalization. But I'm showing some highlights of uh, one of the chapters, which is an example of globalization, and the chapter is called Sex Tourism and the Political Economy of Masculinity. This part of Gregory's fieldwork took place in a beach town with a large tourist and expat population and a reputation for the sex trade. Uh, Stephen Gregory spent most of his time hanging around in a bar that was owned by a middle-aged uh, middle white American man and frequented by others in that same demographic. So back in that expat thing from earlier, these men would definitely consider themselves expats and not immigrants, whereas by comparison, of course, Dominicans who moved to the United States are never called expats. They are called immigrants. But anyway... In this ethnography, the anthropologist Stephen Gregory was interested in what made this place so appealing to these so-called expats and what their presence was like for the locals whose jobs involved catering to them in, in various ways. So not just sex workers, but, uh, you know, bartenders, hotel workers, hotel owners, etc. Uh, what's it like to serve American expats? And uh, with regards to, to sex work, this is his argument in a nutshell. I'm going to quote a couple of sentences from the book. Uh, Stephen Gregory writes, Each year tens of thousands of North American and European men, the majority of them white, travel to the Dominican Republic in search of women over whom they could exercise sexual and domestic discipline as potential husbands, boyfriends, or clients in the sex tourism industry. Through the social practice of this form of heteronormative masculinity, these men collectively constructed and naturalized ideologies of race, class, ethnic, and sex slash gender differences that both registered and reinscribed hierarchies of the global division of labor. So, in other words, this particular form of tourism, according to Stephen Gregory, the anthropologist, is a new form of colonialism in a sense, and for that reason he's very critical of it. But I also want to emphasize that he spent plenty of time talking to the workers as well, including the women that you see in, in the photo on the left who, who work in one of the bars. Most examples of sex tourism are transactions between middle class men from rich countries and poor women from poor countries. Obviously in that situation the women are at a disadvantage, but by no means are, are they helpless. So Gregory's other argument that goes along with the one that I just quoted is that women who participated in sex work transgressed and reworked race and class inflected gender norms relating to their labor power and economic futures while disrupting the heterosexual norms and relations 
desired by male tourists and expatriates. So basically, while remaining critical of the whole structure, but also talking to sex workers in a respectful way, he found they tended to be smart, strategically minded people doing what they needed to do to get by in a hard situation. And on the one hand, he wants us to understand the constraints that are put on their lives. But on the other hand, he says that we shouldn't see them as, as passive victims in need of rescue. Uh, the job market for the poor in, in, in this part of the country is, is very limited. There, there are some sweatshops. There is dangerous agricultural labor. There's some retail, uh, there's the tourist industry, and there's domestic work for, for wealthy locals and uh, so-called expats. But almost all of those jobs pay poverty wages. Uh, the luckiest people have relatives who work decent jobs in New York City mainly who, and send money home. Uh, there's also people who travel to Spain, to Italy, to Germany, and elsewhere and do domestic work, um, often sending money home as well. And then there's also the sex trade, and the sex trade workers that Gregory spoke to had plenty to say about the problems and the dangers of the sex trade, but they were also using it as a way out of that pattern of dependency and victimization, which, which Stephen Gregory says is an example of them transgressing and reworking race and class-inflected gender norms related to their labor power and economic futures, which I'm not sure it might be taking it a bit far, but it's a good illustration, I think, of how these dimensions of inequality and identity affect people's ability to do what they want in their lives. So in other words, it's a classic structure and agency scenario, a very rough situation that limits what people are able to do, but pe people make their own history, just not in conditions of their own choosing. As I said a few times through this series, my favorite Karl Marx quote, or you know, approximation of a quote. Anyway, women in this situation are finding a way to take an exploitative and unfair situation and use it to get themselves an income and maybe even a bit of freedom, according to Stephen Gregory. So to review, if you're able to travel to cross borders at all, you're in a privileged position relative to a lot of humanity. And if you're able to travel to cross borders as a tourist for no other reason but fun, you're in an extremely privileged position relative to a lot of humanity. And in so doing, you're uh, apparently causing about 8% of our greenhouse gas emissions to uh, get drunk on a beach in the Caribbean or to, to find your true self on a mountain in Nepal or something else the tourists do. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I'll let you think about it on your own. Since that's the case, since that's the backdrop, the structure of the story, uh, is it possible to even have tourism that's ethical and or not exploitative? So I'm going to close with that thought. Um, you know, I, I include myself in a lot of those critiques. I should just make that point. This isn't coming from a place of self-righteousness. You know, I'm from a, a wealthy Western country and I've been on vacation before. So I've contributed some of that 8% of climate emissions myself. Mm -hmm.